Welcome back to the radical, strange, and often difficult to navigate world of Victoria 3. My name is Jumbo Pixel, and in this video, I'm going to take you through some systems that perhaps you don't quite understand or you're not fully utilizing. These are some common mistakes and some tips on how to avoid them. If you like this kind of Victoria 3 content, do consider subscribing, and thank you so much for the support recently. My goodness, you've blown me away. Uh, let's get straight into it. The first tip I'd like to share, or system more broadly, are about those naval invasions, because these are one of the rare ways at the moment that we can have a really massive swing difference on a fight, thanks to our human abilities, potentially. Hear me out. The naval invasions, unlike normal troops and armies, where we'd of course mobilize these generals and assign them to different front lines, with the naval invasion we of course have the ability to invade any coastline. And this can really catch both the AI off guard, but I mean, really any enemy potentially. There are some key things that you need to know. The huge big one is that the number of flotillas that your admiral is commanding, in this case it's 11 units, as you can see, must or at least really ought to be more than or greater than the number of battalions the invading general is controlling. So in this case, my admiral has 11. I should absolutely send fewer than 11 battalions along with them to navally invade. So in a test save, don't worry, let's play Persia fans, this isn't my real playthrough. <laughs> Things didn't quite go this bad. I thought I would just quickly demonstrate how this might play out in practice and some quick tips to make it even better. Obviously, our naval invasion can be carried out by jumping to the military tab. Here we have the naval invasion option. I can of course choose to navally invade anywhere, not just assigning to one of these glowing front lines like I might normally have to do. That means that I can perhaps pincer in behind, break through enemy lines, or invade in an unsuspecting allied territory, whomp, like that one there. Now I can assign a general, and of course I'll be careful to assign a general who has fewer battalions than we need. Assigning that one should provide the best opportunity for the troops to get through without being compromised. Will it be perfect every time? No. There are of course a few other things you'll need to build up around this really quickly. On the urban rural level, there is only one thing that's significant. Of course, you'll need to fuel it with fabric and wood, etc. This is the shipyards. These are used to construct both military and civilian ships. And you should and can of course change their production methods. I'll be getting reinforced wooden ones after this fight is done. Don't do it during, you'll suffer additional penalties. Other than that though, really it's the development screen. Of course, the naval bases provide an additional flotilla per level. So build more of these in your territories and get more flotillas, providing of course you can build them. And then you have your ports, providing infrastructure and convoys for, crucially, sending things across the sea. We'll want a variety and a mixture of all of these things to build up a proper industry if we're able to carry out naval invasions and of course trade, like a trading power too. As I assign some different generals to my front lines, we'll talk more about them in a little bit, you also note that there is a little tooltip or cue to show where units are coming, how many of them are proceeding to this front line, and how long it'll take them to get there often. The naval invasions are exactly the same, and as you can see, it can be a little bit difficult to read. But if you hover over this little icon, you will, at the very least, see how many days it's going to take them to prepare their forces. It will usually be quite a few, so bear that in mind. The also <laughs> uh, advancing battalions may need some additional time once they get to the port. So it's important to factor in maybe two months in order to really get this invasion off the line. Now, depending on the scale of conflict, if you've brought in some great powers, you'll also of course need to focus on your military reserves and your battalions. And here I have another few tips and some unknown things about the system that really ought to be shared. The one that's caught me off guard the most has been not having troops ready, battalions in reserve, and not leaving enough conscripts behind. Now, of course, conscripts are very useful, right? We can quickly jump into these territories and activate these conscription centers. Buildings that, of course, as you can see, can be used during a diplomatic play or war to conscript our population. The building will recruit civilian workforce into conscript battalions that are automatically assigned to generals within their HQ. So the first thing to note is it's generals within their HQ. So if I were to do it over here on a different continent, the battalions wouldn't arrive on this side of the world across the strait, 
even though it looks so close, <laughs> to help us out. So anybody that I'm conscripting in here will only be able to fight from this Persian HQ. That's the first relatively simple mistake. The next one, of course, would be to conscript every single person. Now, in desperate times, may very well call for desperate measures, but as the game notes, we're pulling people away from our civilian workforce. This will have dire impacts on our economy. So while we can get away with it, of course, and it will be useful to add extra numbers to our front line, to go through and click every single territory like I'm doing might be a drastic overstep. Also, the game will often warn me about having my battalions in reserve. Oh, look out, you've got some battalions in reserve. You have to promote your generals or increase the command limit or recruit more generals to use them. And that's very true and may very well be something you'll have to do. However, keeping some battalions in reserve is also arguably pretty useful for reinforcing defending front lines, particularly as wars drag on and on and on or if the homeland is in threat, these battalions will rally just like any other conscripts to protect these front lines. And as you can see, some of them can be or could be fairly difficult to protect. The final thing to note here then is to also use the defensive frontline order. I know it's not as exciting as the aggressive one and when we click into our generals, we at the moment really only have two options. But this defensive frontline is very powerful. War of attrition can be won just as readily as an aggressive one, and by holding a defensive front, you'll likely ensure the opponent takes more losses. The other most powerful thing that impacts war support over time is occupied land. Occupied land is huge, so you want to make sure that you defend your core territories, like I'm doing here, against a massive Russian army. As you can see, their offense is of course higher than my defense, but their units are four times greater than mine. If we even get closer to their numbers, we'll be able to defend this front line fairly handily. My conscripts coming online should help with that. Using a mixture of aggressive and defensive orders can also throw the AI. Here I have an aggressive order on this front line and two defensive ones on the other two. The idea of course being that we'll break through, force the AI to come around and reinforce this area, and then seize our primary war goal while they're distracted with all of their forces and potentially some losses up here in the north. While I am winning on this front line, it's a pretty difficult fight. We're fighting against people we didn't necessarily want to be fighting against, and it is absolutely going to be a war of attrition down here. And that's why the power of the naval invasion shouldn't be underestimated. The downside, of course, is that our navy will need to be, as I mentioned earlier, stronger than the rest. But good news, everybody! We're fighting on a new front line. That was the naval invasion. Did you miss it? You, you probably did. Uh, <laughs> it's not a great cue for it, but we did just witness it play out, and now there is a battle. And if we can win this battle, which it doesn't look like we'll be able to do because we have few troops here able to do it, we would successfully launch a naval invasion. And you know what? <laughs> I shouldn't doubt my dudes. Look at them go. Of course, watching the battle in real time, we can see that the, the casualties playing out on the enemy's side, where they seemingly have nobody in charge, not so hot for them. We should be able to successfully actually take this. This war will likely be a piece of cake. As you can see, this unit's automatically allocated itself to advancing this front. It will now push through from behind, rendezvous with the rest of our troops. And I reckon Bob's probably your uncle on at least this minor war goal. And all we had to do with the great power in the north was just hold them off long enough for us to get through, secure the victory on our primary war target. Do keep in mind that some sticky national borders can get in the way sometimes of orders and you might need to reallocate an order or something like that just to get it across the line. But once you do get it across the line and your troops rendezvous together in greatness, Thanks to the flanking ability that the naval invasion currently gives us, we do understand there'll be more of these abilities coming to uh, battalions in future in Victoria 3, but at the minute, this is one of the best ways we've got to crack through. And with the help of our British allies, we were able to do just that. In a more peaceful time, where economies are thriving, there are also other things to address. This next tip actually featured in a recent video of mine. However, there were some audio issues. It was really bad. Sorry about that. I'd like to share it again here though because it was probably the most popular received one in the entire video and that was around the standard of living. In this case I'm going to give it to you in a little bit different fashion. Bear with me. The standard of living effectively is how our people are satisfied, how their needs are satisfied. 
There are three different stratas to consider, the lower, the middle, and the upper class of our society. And you can see when we hover over them that each one of these groups have different professions inside of them. So, and keep this in mind for future, we can tailor to their job needs by building the right kind of infrastructure or buildings. Academics in the middle class, but none of them in the lower strata, for example. The other thing to note is that each strata of society has an expected level, an expected level of living that must be met. And this is generally made up of, of course, the goods and services that they're accessing, by and large. You can see that I'm meeting all of mine, so all of my groups are pretty happy. Standard of living is on the up. And this will, of course, not that you can quite tell at the minute thanks to some harsh political reform, start to reduce or at least decrease the amount of increase <laughs> in radicals. You can see that I'm losing a lot of radicals from increases in standard of living. This is by far and away the easiest way for me to reduce the increase in radicalism. But radicalism aside, let's take a look at one particular group. Probably either our lower or, or upper strata because the middle class are doing A-OK. -okay. <laughs> Jeepers. If we hover over the lower strata's standard of living, we can see that the most important thing is that these pops pay an average of 12.6% higher compared to the average base price for their pop needs. That's going to be pulling money out of their back pocket. And if you're wondering exactly why, well, you get a full breakdown here. You can see all of the goods that they're accessing, but more importantly, what's the relative price in the market? And what percentage of their expenditure does that make up? Down at the bottom of the list, you'll see things like sugar, coffee, and coal. These are all very expensive in our market. However, it makes up none of the expenditure of this group. We want to be looking, of course, towards the top of the list at the most expensive things. In this case, clothes, services, and to a certain extent, opium are the big bad boys. But mainly it's clothes and services. We'll focus, of course, on clothes because that's the most easy one to fix. What we would do is probably go into our economy, look at how we're producing our clothes. Maybe we might up our production levels to try and produce either the right type of clothes or produce them better or faster or quicker. Or of course, we might actually just expand the textile mill, providing jobs to the peasants in the area and also hopefully fixing some inefficiencies in our market. Lowering our tax rate will of course naturally lower taxes, but this will more importantly help us reduce the impacts of a lower standard of living and radicalism. Twofold. Firstly, by literally reducing radicals from standard of living decreases. And secondly, by putting more money in their back pockets. Because, of course, this is a supply and demand function. We could increase the supply of our goods by jumping into the market screen and building some extra textiles factories like I've just done. Maybe we trade for it. Extra trade. Pull some more in. Or we can put more money into their back pockets so they can spend more on their goods. Lowering taxes is the fastest way to do that. We could also look, of course, to improve their job opportunities as well. And while radicalism may rise temporarily if people are getting fired from jobs or maybe you're changing their production methods, do keep that in mind. Another somewhat common mistake that I can see being made. By the time we build up some textile mills, maybe trade with some extra, we should see an increase, a relative increase in their standard of living. You can see it's starting to slowly come down and that impact on the standard of living now has dramatically decreased too. We've made an impact on clothes, the relative price now way down and you can see that services are now a more important issue to these people. By going through and fixing a few of these and focusing in on specific population groups, we can ensure that their standard of living rises and hopefully radicalism decreases. Our populations play arguably a more important role than that though. And if we navigate to the population screen for my next tip, we'll firstly get a much better look at the different stratas in our society, breakdowns of professions, populations. This matters for the politics of your nation, what kind of thing you can push through and what people are doing in their spare time. If everybody are shopkeepers, then they have a lot of political strength. And the group that they're affiliated with, if we hover over them, you can see that shopkeepers' interest group support is 50% for the PBs, 30% for the industrialists, and then some scraps toward the end. So if I'm building an industry that is providing jobs for shopkeepers, I need to bear in mind that I'm probably supporting the overall clout and monetary power, political power, 
of, in this case, the PBs. These groups, of course, also align with the stratas in society that we were talking about earlier. Farmers, part of that lower strata, and heavily, go figure, invested in the rural folk interest group. So these people could be a key target for me if I want to improve that group's relations, or maybe shuffle them along. The key thing that I want to show you here, though, actually lies in the detailed list. <laughs> here we get a really good look at all of the different main sectors within our society. These are the people who are filling up our interest groups. And of course, they kind of give it away at the start. They'll either be politically inactive, part of a group that doesn't have literacy or a standard of living or laws that allow them to vote, or they're marginalized. When they're not though, you get a really good sense as to what they're about. If we take a look at the aristocrats, for example, we can see they're part of our upper strata. They are, as indicated by this icon, predominantly a land-owning group. They have some intelligentsia as in their second place, though. So they're a group that, in this case, if I was looking to support the intelligentsia, I like, but I don't love. I might want to provide more jobs to them, more opportunity, put more money in their back pockets. Depending on the politics of your nation, there'll be certain groups here and their relative size that'll be more or less important to you. I might be, if I'm looking to push a government that's led by the intelligentsia, for example, be interested in helping out the bureaucrats and the academics, maybe also the capitalists and the aristocrats, to try and build up an economy around these people for the most part, or at least give them the best opportunity. These, dare I say, upper strata, higher end pops, also provide a key thing for your economy as you move through the game. A key takeaway that if you miss, you'll find you'll just flounder and fail. And that is as you get more technologies and start to upgrade your workshops, maybe you're getting mechanized workshops in the furniture. Or as we talked about earlier, you're getting sewing machines instead of sewing everything by hand in your textile mills. This is great for productivity. Likewise, chemical plants and more advanced goods and services. Vacuum evaporation? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> right? We don't even know. These things are difficult. And as you note, if we look at this one as an example, this will increase employment of engineers by 1,000. However, we will, of course, need different goods to operate it. One of the more nuanced and interesting ones might be the university. The university provides qualifications to educate our people and allow them to move up. It also provides innovation so we can research things faster. Crucially here, you'll see the employment is increasing across some key groups, mainly the academics. And this will also provide those qualifications so that we can actually service more advanced industries. Some industries, as you move through the game, will require educated populations. They'll require those engineers or those academics to really get the job done. You'll need some of them, at least then on board, to be able to produce things and actually staff some more advanced employment opportunities. The last thing that I wanted to show in this section of the video is in this view. As we look into our buildings, decrees, and state actions, particularly in the political lens, you'll start to see where these populations are based. And this is the final part of your puzzle to shaping maybe the structure of your society and government, or simply lifting up groups and pushing down others. You can see where they're located. Look at all of our intelligentsia in this state. Now that's by design. I've put lots of universities and development and, and real nerd resource in here, whereas in other areas I've rather ignored it. And you can get a different feel for who's where. Of course, we could enact different, uh, say, authority actions to lift up or push down areas as well. But this is important to understand where your people are and how to shape a nation. Now, sometimes in Victoria 3, trade doesn't quite go your way. And so in this final section, I'd like to talk about trade agreements and disagreements. The disagreements is probably where the most common misunderstandings or mistakes are made. Uh, obviously, if we jump into the market screen, we can get a look at our trade routes. We can get a look at ones coming in or out, and we can mess with things like their tariffs if we want to make a little bit more or less money. We can use our convoys, of course, to export different goods around the world or import them in to fill our needs. That's all fine and good. Sometimes, though, things don't quite go to plan. Now, if your trade laws enable it and you're trading with other people, uh, most of you will be, unless perhaps you're a completely isolationist state. Here's looking at you, Japan. Uh, generally speaking, you'll be trading to, in some capacity. This will mean that other nations can open up trade routes with you and buy your goods. Great for your economy, but maybe not for your domestic supply. And it could create issues in certain areas within the economy and you just don't even know they're there. 
If you'd like to stop another nation from trading with you, it is possible. Right click on them if they're within your strategic interest region and you're able to embargo them. However, you might not be able to straight away. You might need to damage your relations with them first. Or one of the best things to do is to expel their diplomats. Expelling their diplomats boots them out. It does give you a little bit of infamy, but it really knocks down those relations and can offer different, sometimes unique uh, diplomatic options, including, of course, this crucial one here, the embargo. Do note, as it's an ongoing action, it will cost you a little bit of influence, but you should be able to afford this. This will prevent the nation from trading with you at all. A couple of interesting things to note, it will of course stop them from taking things from our market, importing or exporting goods. And of course an embargo will happen automatically when you enter war with a nation as well. So do bear in mind that could be messing with some trade routes that are keeping your economy afloat. It's a difficult thing to balance. I'm sure you'll be able to do it. The embargo is a more swift action, but can be taken if you just really don't want to be trading with another state for whatever reason. The other option that might be available to you if you'd like to move more towards the trade agreement side, particularly if you're a smaller power, maybe you're looking to move into or trade with other markets more easily or readily, is the trade agreement. In this case, I have an active trade agreement with Great Britain. You can see it's costing me again some monthly influence, arguably one of the most easiest resources to manage in Victoria 3, at least in my opinion. And what this trade agreement's doing is, of course, increasing our relations. Great for me. It's also removing barriers to trade. So it's reducing things, completely removing things, such as the bureaucratic cost involved in keeping trade routes active. Of course, we'll still need to physically trade with things like convoys, but by removing a lot of the cost, it makes it much easier to get access to markets without completely merging with them. It's a step in between, enabling free and easier trade, even if your laws aren't strictly set to free trade laws. Take note though that it will also of course impact the tariffs, so your income may rise or fall depending on how your economy is structured, and this is probably the final thing that could easily be overlooked here. Tariffs on imports and exports generate you a little bit of cash, and that depends on how your trade policy is set up. Mercantilism here, as you can see, for no priority tariffs, which is most of them by default, are getting 15% on imports, 5 on exports. If we swap over to free trade, no tariffs. Losing all that money, but potentially trading much easier. And then of course there are ones in between. Maybe protectionism is more favoured by you to make a little bit more money on your exports, less on imports. It's up to you how you want to structure it, but bear in mind that any of the actions that I've discussed, like embargoing or trade agreements moving the other way, will have an impact on your balance book, something you'll want to try and keep fairly if not perfectly well balanced. Thank you very much for joining me today, everybody, in another Victoria 3 slightly more advanced tips video. Thank you very much for the support on all of the Vic 3 stuff. It's been insane. And I will see you all next time.